My name is Patrick Brown, and I am a climate scientist at the Carnegie Institution for Science at Stanford University. And this video is called, Do Propagation of Error Calculations Invalidate Climate Model Projections of Global Warming? And so what this video is, is going to be a critical evaluation of claims made by Dr. Patrick Frank, who is a scientist at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And Dr. Frank has made a number of publicly available writings and presentations where he argues that climate model projections of global warming are essentially useless. And so I'll be pulling from two of those uh, presentations today, uh, primarily. So one is a talk he gave last summer at the Doctors for Disaster Preparedness meeting uh, called No Certain Doom on the Accuracy of Projected Global Average Surface Air Temperatures. And then the other presentation I'll be pulling from is a 2013 AGU poster called Propagation of Error and the Reliability of Global Air Temperature Projections. So um, I study the behavior of climate models in my work, so I thought the claims uh, that Dr. Frank uh, is making in these presentations are interesting and uh, provocative. And, you know, I believe science advances best through open and honest discussions of disagreements, and so I'm making this video in that spirit. Uh, so my intent here is simply to investigate with a critical eye some of the public arguments made by Dr. Frank, and thus my intent is not to attack Dr. Frank personally. So I just want to uh, summarize quickly Dr. Frank's uh, primary argument, and so it basically goes like this. Uh, he argues that climate models have errors in their simulation of clouds, which is true. Uh, climate models project global warming in an iterative manner, meaning that the state of the system at any time t depends on its state uh, during previous time steps. Uh, errors in the Earth's energy budget, which come from the cloud fields in particular, uh, propagate or compound through the model's uh, calculations uh, through time. And the propagated error in global mean temperature in particular is much larger than any greenhouse gas induced uh, signal either you know over the past hundred years or into the future say a hundred years and so Dr. Frank illustrates that with plots like this this is from his AGU poster uh, where on the left hand side he has um, kind of the traditional uh, way of showing uncertainty in climate model projections where the uh, spread of the individual model runs is used as kind of a confidence interval and he argues that when you uh, use his method that um, he argues accurately accounts for the error in the climate model uh, simulations. And when you propagate that error through, you get uh, uncertainty ranges that are much, much larger than the actual kind of signal in forced uh, temperature change. And so that is then used to make uh, conclusions like this. This is from his AGU poster. Um, so one, climate models are unable to resolve the effects of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Uh, two, global air temperature projections presently have no predictive value. And three, detection and attribution currently remain impossible, meaning that we uh, can't know uh, what caused various temperature trends uh, in the past. And in Dr. Frank's um, talk at the doctors for disaster preparedness meeting, uh, he goes kind of even further and has even more sweeping uh, conclusions uh, like there's um, nothing that climate models reveal about future global warming. Uh, climate models don't tell us anything about human greenhouse gas fingerprint on terrestrial climate. There's no merit of projection or predictions of future warming. Uh, the IPCC's warnings of catastrophe uh, have no reliability, and there's no evidence uh, for looming climate disaster from CO2 emissions. So first I just want to point out that quantifying uncertainties in climate model projections is really important. And in particular, uncertainties in our quantification of how clouds and aerosols operate and how to simulate them uh, is really important for both understanding current climate and projecting climate into the future. And so chapter 7 and chapter 9 of the last uh, IPCC report cites kind of hundreds of peer-reviewed papers uh, attempting to do just that. And there's also uh, this project called the Cloud Feedback Model Intercomparison Project, which is completely dedicated 
uh, to trying to figure out how clouds respond in the climate system and trying to quantify uh, those uncertainties and how they affect uh, climate model projections. So my point in this video is not to uh, say that trying to quantify uncertainties in climate model projections is not important. I think it's extremely important. Uh, my only point here is that it must be done uh, correctly. And so I'll raise a couple issues um, in which I think perhaps Dr. Frank's method is not doing things correctly. Okay, so here I'll give um, some details on Dr. Frank's method for quantifying uncertainty in climate model projections. Uh, so first, a, a brief digression on the propagation of uncertainty. So I think kind of the easiest way to think about uh, the propagation of uncertainty would be in a situation like this, where you basically have a person uh, starting at some location, and you say that person takes three steps and travels a total distance, uh, capital D, uh, over those three steps. So let's say each individual step, uh, lowercase d, is five units long. Then, of course, the total distance is 15 units. Now, if we say there's some uncertainty in each one of these step lengths, and we you know, assume independence, then we can use this uh, linear formula for the propagation of error, where the standard deviation, the uncertainty in the total distance d, is represented by the standard deviation, and that's equal to plus or minus the square root of the uncertainty in each one of these step lengths, represented by the variance. So if you have a standard deviation of two for each one of these step lengths, then you could just plug that into this linear formula for propagation of error and get plus or minus 3.46 units. So if you wanna ask the question, how far did the person travel after three steps? You would say 15, and then taking into account this uncertainty of each step length, you'd say 15 plus or minus uh, 3.46, and you'd have a 68% confidence in that because we're using uh, plus or minus one standard deviation. And this is called the propagation of error or propagation of uncertainty because you're trying to figure out the error or uncertainty in something where you don't, you're not actually measuring that. You're measuring the uncertainty in the individual components that combined in some way to make your final calculation. So the error is propagating through the calculation and you're trying to get at you know, what the error is in your final uh, product. So what Dr. Frank's method is attempting to do, it's basically trying to apply this linear propagation of uncertainty to climate model projections. So this is a um, portion of his AGU poster um, where he's showing different uh, global climate model projections. This is an 80 year projection, and this is um, into the 21st century uh, projection. And these individual colored lines are climate model runs, and then the multi model mean is the black line in both of these cases. And what Dr. Frank is showing here is that you can emulate the multi model mean pretty closely by using a simple uh, linear equation. So this linear equation is just saying the change in temperature is related to some constant times the uh, fractional change in greenhouse gas forcing. And so you can uh, kind of simplify this equation and this equation and put it, uh, put these numbers just into a coefficient a. So if you expand this out, you can see that uh, the change in the total change in temperature is related to a constant um, times the kind of fractional increase in greenhouse gas forcing at year one plus the fractional increase at year two plus the fractional increase at year three. So the total change in temperature is just a sum of all of the changes uh, in the individual uh, years. And so now you can see that this is analogous to the linear propagation of error that we were talking about with the person taking steps. So what you would need to find is then the uncertainty represented here by the standard deviation in each one of these uh, temperature changes for each uh, term from year to year. And so then you can use the linear formula for the propagation of error to find the total uncertainty in the change in temperature over the entire uh, time frame. So then the question becomes what to use uh, for these uncertainty values in order to get your, in order to propagate your uncertainty and get your total uncertainty in the ch change in temperature over time. 
so what Dr. Frank has used in his um, presentations on this subject is a number that comes from this Lauer and Hamilton study. And this study was called Simulating Clouds with Global Climate Models, a comparison of CMIP-5 results with CMIP-3 and satellite data. And so the number that's used is the multimodal mean of the spatial or climatological root mean square error of long wave cloud forcing. So this is the error between models and observations where observations are coming from the International Satellite Cloud Climatology Project. And this is a root mean square error that's calculated over a 20 year time period from 1988 to 2007. And this error statistic uh, turns out to be four watts per meter squared. And so using that uncertainty statistic or er error statistic, you can then calculate um, uncertainties in temperature for each time step. And so according to Dr. Frank's method, those uncertainties in temperature are then what go into the formula for the linear propagation of error. And that's how you get a total error uh, for the change in temperature as a function of time, just depending on how many time steps uh, you have. And so when you do that calculation, this is the type of thing that you get. So this is my own reproduction of Dr. Frank's uh, equation and uncertainty uh, interval that he uh, produces in his uh, presentations. And so this is a temperature uh, projection from 1900 to 2100 uh, using um, the simple linear model that emulates uh, global temperature. And so I'm using for forcings the historical IPCC forcings uh, that go from 1900 to 2005. And then from 2005 to 2100, I'm using the RCP 8.5 uh, emission scenario. And so what you see here is that once you start calculating this uh, propagation of error statistic and start plotting uh, the uncertainty on top of the uh, on top of what actually is output from that linear equation, you see that this uncertainty range immediately blows up to be extremely big. And so on this uh, temperature scale, you can't even see it. It immediately goes off uh, the edge of the graph. But if you zoom way out to plus 20 minus uh, 15 uh, degrees Celsius, you can see it. And so this is a completely you know, unphysical uh, range of uncertainty. So it's uh, totally not plausible that that for instance temperature could decrease uh, by you know 15 degrees as we're increasing co2 um, and it's implausible as well that temperature could increase by 20 degrees celsius as we're increasing uh, co2 under this rcp 8.5 scenario but as far as i understand it this is the point that dr frank is trying to make so he's essentially saying that uh, when you properly account for the uncertainty in the climate model projections, the uncertainty becomes so large so quickly that you can't actually draw any meaning from the projections that the climate models are making. So hopefully I have summarized Dr. Frank's method uh, accurately here. And uh, if I have, and if I understand it correctly, I would like to raise uh, a number of issues with this method. So I've outlined five different issues that I want to bring up uh, for the remainder of this video. Uh, so the first one is the arbitrary use of one year as a compounding time scale. So I'll talk about that. Uh, and then I have three kind of separate but related issues on the use of this plus or minus four watts per meter squared uh, long wave uh, cloud error as the uncertainty statistic. So, uh, one has to do with it being a spatial root mean square error instead of a global mean error. Uh, one has to do with it being an error in just one component of the energy budget rather than an error in the net imbalance. And then another one has to do with the use of this error, which is a base state error, rather than looking at a uh, response error. And then finally, I'll end um, talking about the famous uh, James Hansen 1988 uh, projections of global temperature, which it went out to the year 2020. And uh, Dr. Frank brings up this projection uh, in order to dismiss it, but I think that uh, the temperature progression since this projection came out actually seems to support the notion that uh, climate 
change is relatively predictable on these time scales, and it does not support the claim that it's completely unpredictable like these types of uh, uncertainty ranges would suggest. So uh, first, the arbitrary use of one year is the compounding time scale. Okay, so Dr. Frank's method uh, seems to assume that the plus or minus four watts Wiener squared uh, error in the long wave cloud forcing is somehow intrinsically tied uh, to the annual time scale. So this error uh, compounds annually in the calculation that I'm showing here and in the and into the in the calculations that Dr. Frank uh, shows in his presentations. Uh, so this four watts per meter squared error is not intrinsically tied to the annual time scale. So it came from this Lauer and Hamilton paper, and it's a time invariant mean flux error. So it's a root mean square error, but it's calculated over a 20 year time period. So there's nothing intrinsic about it that makes it tied to the annual time scale. In that paper, they actually do talk about it being an annual mean error, but they're only saying annual mean to distinguish it from the seasonal uh, errors. So you could have a winter mean error or a spring mean error, and this is the annual mean error. So the choice of the time scale to compound over is actually totally arbitrary for this number. So you could compound it over, say, one second, or you could compound it over 20 years, the time scale that it was actually calculated over. So if you compare com the uncertainty ranges that you would get from compounding annually to the uncertainty ranges that you would get if you compound every 20 years, you see that you get much smaller uncertainty ranges when you compound over 20 years. And so the point here is just that a method is not particular, particularly useful in this case for quantifying the uncertainty in a climate model projection if arbitrary decisions like this, like the time scale to compound uncertainty over, lead to totally different results. So that's all I'll say about that. Another issue that I'd like to raise uh, has to do with the choice of using the spatial root mean square error uh, instead of a global mean net error. So let's just for the moment uh, assume that the base state cloud long wave forcing error is the relevant error statistic to use, um, which I'll be uh, taking issue with in the next uh, two points. But for the moment, assume that that is the right statistic to use. Um, the method then uses the spatial root mean squared error between models and observations calculated over a 20 year time period. So what that means is if you subtract models from observations, um, you, you, know, you get a plot like this for long wave cloud forcing error. And you see that some of the errors are positive and some of the errors are negative. So if you take the root mean square error, you're first squaring all of the errors, so you're making them all become positive. And to me, that doesn't make sense because global mean temperature is related to mean net error. So it's not related to accumulated error uh, where you take the absolute value first and then add up all of the errors. It's, it's related to the net uh, error. So if we look at net errors, um, from models. This is what you get for long wave cloud forcing errors. So there's 28 uh, different models here and the multi-model mean is uh, 26 for the long wave cloud forcing and the uh, series observations, so this, these are satellite observations, uh, give you 27.6 uh, for long wave cloud forcing. So the mean, the multi-model mean uh, is only 1.6 watts per meter squared below uh, the satellite observations. But I'll just point out here that some models are quite poor in their simulation of long wave cloud forcing. So this model uh, has an error of uh, 9 watts per meter squared. But some models are quite good. So this GFDL model um, has an order of 0.1 watts per meter squared error in the mean net error. But between satellites and observations for long wave cloud forcing. So if we use, if we compare the uncertainty ranges that come from putting these different errors uh, into Dr. Frank's method, we get something like this. So looking at this longer or this larger uh, temperature scale, we see that using the plus or minus nine watts per meter squared as the error, 
you get this, you know, just ridiculously large uh, range of like plus or minus 40 degrees Celsius out to the year 2100. But if you use 0.1 watts per meter squared, uh, it's not even, the error range isn't even visible on this uh, temperature scale. So I would just, you know, ask the question here is, does it make sense that two models that roughly predict the same amount of warming by the year 2100 would have uncertainty ranges that differ by orders of magnitude? And so to me, this is, again, evidence that this method is not uh, as useful as advertised. Okay, so the next issue that I'd like to bring up is the issue of using an error in just one component of the energy budget rather than using an error in the net uh, imbalance of the energy budget. So this is just a cartoon of the Earth's uh, energy budget. So this is uh, the radiative components at the top of the atmosphere. So you have the incoming shortwave component, and then you have a portion of the shortwave uh, reflected back to space, both from clouds and from the surface. So that's the albedo of the Earth. And then the Earth you know, has a temperature, so it radiates long wave energy to space. And typically that can be broken down into both a <clears throat> clear sky component as well as a cloud component. And then uh, here I have just a flux of heat from the ocean's mixed layer into the deeper ocean. So change in global mean surface air temperature is related to the net flux on this uh, system that's basically composed of the atmosphere plus the upper ocean mixed layer. Uh, and then it's also related to the heat capacity, which is um, essentially dependent on the depth of the mixed layer. So if you break this net flux down into these components that I'm showing here, you see you know, change in, in global mean surface temperature is related to uh, the incoming shortwave radiation minus cloud shortwave minus clear sky shortwave minus long wave cloud minus clear uh, long wave, and, you know, assuming all of these terms are positive out of the system, and minus this Q term. So if we're interested in the uncertainty in the change in temperature, it should really be related to the uncertainty in the net flux. But what Dr. Frank's method seems to be doing is it's taking an uncertainty in just one component, in the cloud long wave component, and it's relating it to the uncertainty in the change in temperature. So alternatively, we could think about, okay, what's the uncertainty in the net flux? And you know some models are essentially imperfect net energy balance, um, at least when you're averaging over a long enough period of time, uh, when their historical simulations start, and they typically start in 1861. So that means that the net flux is zero at the beginning of the simulations, which is what uh, it essentially should be um, in these idealized situations. And so just if you were going to use that as your error statistic and you plot that on top of your simulation out to 2100, you would see that, of course, there actually is no uh, uncertainty ranges using uh, Dr. Frank's method because a model with no persistent net energy imbalance would have essentially no error. And so then you get no uncertainty in uh, global temperature. And I would say that this is actually a more relevant uh, error to put into this method than the long wave cloud forcing uh, error. So the last issue that I want to bring up uh, with the use of this plus or minus four watts per meter squared uh, root mean square error as the uh, error statistic here is uh, the use of a base state error uh, rather than a uh, response error. So I'm going to illustrate uh, my issue with this with a kind of uh, simple example of a change in temperature using uh, essentially the most simple representation of the Earth's climate system that you can make that uh, has some basis in physical reality. So this is uh, an equation that just says a change in global mean surface air temperature is related to the energy coming into the system. Uh, very similar to the equation I showed in the last uh, couple slides. Uh, so the energy coming into the system is short wave uh, minus the energy leaving uh, the system in the long wave. And here um, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that this is the actual true system that we're trying to model. 
And we're going to be asking the question, what happens with a 5% decrease in this epsilon term over 100 years? So epsilon is the effective emissivity uh, of the system. And so this is analogous to uh, increasing greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere. So when you run this equation with a uh, very small uh, heat capacity, you see that um, essentially you can start off at 288 uh, degrees Kelvin. And then as you decrease... Uh, emissivity over 100 years, you get a warming of approximately uh, 4 degrees Kelvin or Celsius uh, over, this time, over this time frame. And so now I'm going to ask the question of what happens if you have a model uh, that very, that's very close to simulating the true system, uh, but it has an error in its base state. So in this case, I'm going to say it has a 5% low bias in emissivity, which I'm calling uh, emissivity subscript M here. And then we're going to ask the same question of what happens when you decrease emissivity by 5% over 100 years. And so what I'm showing here is that the mean bias uh, makes it so that the base climate state is off by essentially 4 degrees. But then as you decrease emissivity over 100 years, you get essentially the same amount of warming. And so we, you know, in, in contemporary climate science, we're interested in how much warming we're going to get over 100 years. And so in this case, this model accurately uh, projected that, even though it had an error uh, in the base state. So then the question becomes, what would Dr. Frank's uh, method say about this uh, base state error in terms of how that would uh, affect the uncertainty ranges of the response uh, going forward in time over 100 years. And so this is the result if you plug that um, base state error into Dr. Frank's method. You see that using that as the error statistic, you get these huge, you know, uh, exploding uncertainty ranges, very similar to what we saw with the linear model of the climate model projections. And so what I'm demonstrating here is that the model, I've set it up intentionally so that the model of our system essentially perfectly predicts the response or the warming of 4 degrees Celsius. But that base state error, if you use that as the uncertainty statistic, uh, compounds annually and causes these totally unrealistic uh, uncertainty ranges uh, going into the future. And so one objection to this might be that uh, here I've assumed that an error in the base state does not leak into an error in the response. And that's true. I did assume that just for demonstrative uh, purposes. But I would note that uh, it actually has been shown that for climate models, there is no relationship between the base state error in global mean surface air temperature and the response. So this is equilibrium climate sensitivity or how much warming you get for uh, two times CO2. And this is the uh, simulated global mean surface air temperature at the beginning of uh, these simulations. And so there's no relationship here, meaning that there's not a systematic leakage of base state bias into uh, the response in global climate models for global mean, global mean surface air temperature. So another point I'd like to make is that this concept in no way is restricted to just modeling the Earth's climate. So uh, we can do this example uh, very similarly in a you know, totally seemingly unrelated uh, situation where here I'm plotting the relationship between age and height of Americans, uh, height in centimeters here, with an uncertainty range. And so let's just say that this uh, relationship is the true relationship of the entire population. And let's say you wanted to model this relationship, but you just you know, take some sample of the population, um, and your sample is not totally representative. So there's a mean bias uh, in your sample. And you're still trying to figure out, okay, what's the relationship between uh, age and height? And uh, you get some relationship that's similar to the base, the real uh, population that you're trying to model. So if you use uh, Dr. Frank's method, though, and you propagate this base state uncertainty 
uh, throughout the calculation. What Dr. Frank's method is essentially saying is that because you have an error in the base state, you now have no idea what the relationship is between height and age uh, in this case. And so we know that that essentially doesn't make sense, that just because there's a base state error, it doesn't mean that now you have no idea what the response uh, is, or in this case, the relationship between age and height. Um, and so we can go back to our original uh, illustration of how uh, propagation of error is uh, calculated and make kind of the same point. So let's say this is the same, um, these are the same numbers I showed uh, previously, and let's say that this is the true system that we're trying to model how long, uh, how long of a distance somebody walked. And we're going to say model that but we have some initial error in the location of the person. So let's say it's an error of five units. And let's say our model then uh, projects how far this person is going to travel, and the model gets it you know, correct. So it's, it says that the total distance traveled is 15 uh, plus or minus 3.46. But what Dr. Frank's method seems to be doing is it's calculating an uncertainty in the total distance traveled that's related, it's using the base state error as the error statistic and compounding that. And so when you do that, you get a much larger error uh, or a much larger uncertainty range uh, in your calculation than the true uncertainty range. So the method would produce um, a total distance traveled of 15 units plus or minus 8.66 in this situation rather than the true uncertainty of 3.46. So what I would say here is just that a bias or an error or an uncertainty in the base state of a system should not be treated as the same thing as an error or an uncertainty in the response of that system to some uh, external stimulus. So the last point I'll make here is a more practical point rather than a technical point, and that's to uh, revisit the uh, rather famous projections of global mean surface air temperature from James Hansen in 1988 that were uh, presented to Congress. And Dr. Frank brings up these projections in his uh, talk on this uh, method. And so this is his plot. So he's showing here um, the projections from James Hansen from 1959 out to the year 2020. And there's three different scenarios. There's a rapid increase in greenhouse gas scenario. There's a business as usual scenario. And there's a curtailed scenario, which is like a mitigation uh, scenario. And um, there are issues with these uh, projections. Like we do think this model was too sensitive to the increase in greenhouse gases. And so... Uh, we do think that these lines are increasing a little bit too quickly. Um, but so Dr. Frank brings up these projections to show uh, what would happen when he uses his uh, uncertainty propagation method to add the, you know, what he would claim are the true error bars to these uh, projections. And so, you know, essentially what this plot is saying is that these projections in surface air temperature uh, do not give us, you know, any information about what, what the real surface air temperature will do uh, in the future. So climate models in general, the argument goes, uh, don't give us any information about how uh, global mean surface air temperature will respond to greenhouse gas forcings. But so a, a reality check on that is to just to actually plot the actual observations and how they have uh, evolved over time. So if you plot the observations on top of here, we see that in the year 2016, we are essentially in the middle of this range of projected uh, global temperature. And so on this uh, temperature scale, we're right down the middle of what the climate model projections uh, actually say. So then the question is, if Dr. Frank's method is correct in saying that climate models uh, essentially give us no information about how temperature will progress in the future, what are the odds that the observations would essentially follow right down the middle of this path? I mean, we would expect uh, temperatures to drift off into any direction 
if it was true that climate models give us no constraint on how temperatures uh, should progress in the future. And we can make this argument with updated models and observations as well. So this is uh, the contemporary models, so the most recent generation, and this is a, an expanded uh, temporal scale, so going back to 1900 and then out to the year uh, 2050. So the model mean is plotted with the uh, black line and then the spread about the models is uh, plotted in the gray shading. And then on top of that is observations uh, from NASA. And we see that in the year you know, 2016, we're actually above the multi-model mean and we've uh, never fallen far outside of the spread of the models uh, since uh, 1900. And so the question here uh, my rhetorical question is, how long would observed temperature need to stay close to the climate model projections before we can say that climate models are giving us useful information about how temperature responds to greenhouse gas forcing? So if observations continue to stay kind of within this range as greenhouse gases continue to increase, at what point are we willing to say, okay, the models actually are constraining uh, how temperature should respond to greenhouse gases because at some point we have to say if temperature stays within this range we have to say that the models are giving us useful information. So just to summarize uh, I want to stress that I think it's extremely important to evaluate the uncertainty of climate model projections. Uh, however I do not think that the method proposed uh, here by Dr. Frank is adequate for that task. So first, uh, I don't think that the error that Dr. Frank uses has any intrinsic time scale attached to it. So this plus or minus four watts per meter squared root mean square error uh, is calculated over a 20 year time period and that's really a time invariant flux error. And so you could just as easily compound that error over 20 years as you could over one year. Uh, it does not make sense to use the spatial root mean square error rather than a net error because global temperature is uh, related to the net energy imbalance, not a error that would be associated with taking absolute values first and then summing those absolute values over space. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to isolate uh, one error in the Earth's energy budget, so in this case the long wave cloud forcing error and then relate that to the error in surface temperature change because the surface temperature change is intrinsically related to the net energy imbalance. So you'd want to figure out what the error is in the net energy imbalance and relate that to the error in the temperature change. And uh, finally, I don't think it makes sense to use an error in the base state and then essentially compound that continuously uh, into the response error. So I think that historical projections, both uh, projections from 1988 from James Hansen as well as updated versions of those, show us that climate models actually are constraining temperature change. And so the notion that climate models give us no information about how temperature will change in response to greenhouse gas forcing uh, seems to me to be refuted by actual observations. So do propagation of error calculations invalidate climate model projections of global warming, as Dr. Frank claims? Uh, I would say no. I very much remain unconvinced.